You know, so for Father's Day, I sent out this, this meme to a whole bunch of preacher friends of mine, and I, and I said, I hope your tie this year is the best one ever. <laughs> and I got home, and I sent it to all my, my sons and my son-in-laws, and when I got home, my daughter, she gave me this, this tie. I said, really, I get a tie? Another tie? And she said, but that's a special tie. I said, what's so special about it? Oh, man, my, two of my 13 grandkids right there, and it says, we love Papa. So I said, all right, okay, that's a good tie. I'll take that. <laughs> you know, I wanted to share something with you tonight. I wanna, I, I, if you don't get a blessing out of the, the message tonight, I want to at least, I, I know I can get a blessing in your heart. I heard a, a prayer a few years ago. It's one of the best prayers I'd ever heard. I mean, you can tell when I tell it to you, you'll understand it was an, an incredibly great man of God that prayed this prayer. It's a number of years ago, and he prayed, Lord, this year you took my favorite movie actor, Patrick Swayze. And then, Lord, you took my favorite movie actress, Farrah Fawcett. And then, Lord, you took my favorite singer, uh, Michael Jackson. And Lord, I just wanted you to know that my favorite politician is Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> I like that one. Amen. You know, help is one of the most important words in our language, in our society. When somebody calls for help, there's a problem, a big problem. When someone calls for help, normally there's there's an emergency. There's something wrong. When someone calls for help, they don't, they, don't know what, they don't know how to solve it by themselves. They need outside help of themselves. You know, we think of the lifeguard and someone's going under and they might just barely gurgle up a little bit and then they cry out, help! You can see that kind of urgency, that passion. And, uh, you know, if, if somebody doesn't save them, it's over. Right. It's amazing in the Bible there's only one time. There's only one time in the Bible that it says, help, Lord. It's only one time. Now, there are times where they talk about God helping them, but the urgency, the passion, is not there. Like when somebody yells out, help, Lord! Psalm 46, 5 says, God shall help her. It's a nice verse. It's encouraging. Second Chronicles 32, 8. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us. That's a great verse. But don't have that passion, that urgency of that, of just terror of emergency. God, we've we got to have your help now. Isaiah 50 verse 7, for the Lord God will help me. Those are great verses. They'll all preach. They all talk about God helping them, but it doesn't have anywhere the intensity of someone screaming out, help Lord. Now I want you to take your Bibles with me and go to Psalm chapter 12. We'll go back later on to that verse in, in Genesis. Uh, but, but go to Psalm chapter number 12 very quickly. In Psalm chapter 12, look with me at verse 1. It says, help, Lord. You see that? I wonder, why that? I wonder why that screamed out. Oh, God, help us. We're in a mess down here. God, we need your help. Well, why did he yell that out? Look at the next phrase. For the godly man ceaseth. Wow. That, to me, is where we're sitting at right now in this country. I can just sense, you know, if that psalmist was here, he'd say, oh, God, we need help. We're in a mess down here. You know, uh, when I saw that, I realized one of the biggest things in the world that someone would need help for and one of the most important things in life in a country, the most important thing in a family, in a home, is a godly man. Amen. You know, uh, what a tragic thing to hear, the godly man ceaseth. In other words, we're losing him. Yeah. It's starting to become in America like the sighting of Bigfoot. Good. To find a godly man. Amen. And, and, and when the godly man ceases, the family will be a mess. Amen. When the godly man ceases, the home won't run right. When the godly man ceases, the women will have to take charge of the home because the men won't. Right. And now they're outside of their God-given role. When the godly man sees the children 
don't get the discipline they need. They don't get the love and the attention that they need. And when the godly man sees that, listen, the churches get messed up. And when the churches get messed up, the nation gets messed up. Amen. Where are the godly men? Where are they? You know what? Uh, I don't know anything better that could be said about a person than that they were a godly man, a godly woman. What else would be better than being a godly man? Not a whole lot. You see, a man that is like God, he thinks like God, he talks like God, he loves like God, he helps people like God, and he's holy like God. What an incredible thing to be called a, 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 a godly man. Amen. Incredible. Now, our current country, uh, our U.S. culture, is in a supreme mess. Amen. That's right. I mean, I don't know how it could get any worse than we are. You know, they are purposely trying to sexualize our children. Right. Right. Purposely. Uh, they're having these drag queen story hours. And just these, these filthy, ungodly people that should never be allowed in the presence of children. Amen. And, 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 and see, I'm, I'm sure by now that you've figured it out that the, the mainstream media is a, a complete medium for satanic pro, uh, propaganda. And, and they're, they're pushed by these antichrist globalist elites, these one world uh, people, uh, these nations without borders people. Uh, but the, 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 the truth of the matter is, is that if you, if you just check out some of the headlines uh, of the news in our country, you kind of see where they're all headed with this stuff. You stand up and you say, hey, that's not right. And if you fight against drag queens perverting and grooming your children... The news media says you're protesters targeting drag queens. See how they flip that? Now you're the bad guy. See? Uh, your opposition to drag queens is, is scaring children. That's, that's, that's headlines. And, and then there, here's a headline. Because you're opposing the, the, this stuff, you're a far-right, very orchestrated attack machine. Amen. And you are a threat to the LGBTQ, XYZ, everything else event. And according to them, opposition to this stuff only comes from extremists, militias, and far-right personalities. See what they're trying to do? Look, right. they call, if you ever watch sometimes in the news, uh, something will happen and some famous Southern Baptist will stand up and say something. And the news media will say, He's uh, from the far right. Now listen, if the, if the liberal Southern Baptists are the far right, can you imagine where we're located? <laughs> Somewhere way over there, you know, way out there in the right are, 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 are us, you see. The truth, I never did imagine a few years ago that we would see out an all-out sexual attack on our children. But here we are. It's, it, it, but we've got to stand and continue to fight against all this stuff. As we recently celebrated Father's Day. You know, it's an amazing thing, men, to, to look at the reality of our country. If there's ever been a time for a godly man to rise up, it's now. Amen. It's now. Our, our country is hanging by a thread. Sir. It amazes me. I, I'll, I'll get to it in a second, but, but, but our problem is not Joe Biden. Our problem is not Washington, D.C., Judgment's got to start at the house of God. Amen. The reality is, is that, that it, more than 18.5 million children are fatherless in America right now. 18.5 million children are fatherless tonight. That's according to Fox News. Our, our, and the United States leads the entire world in that category. That's a record I, I don't think we want to aspire to having. You see, uh, you see the dysfunction of, of children and, and families. It's, 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 it's saddening. Some people would say it's not that big of a, a deal to not have a father present in the home. You know, the psalmist disagrees. The psalmist says, help, Lord. We need some godly men down here. Our kids need them. Our wives need them. Our churches need them. 
Our country needs some godly men. Yes. Think not having a father isn't a big deal. You'd be very mistaken. Listen to this. 85% of children and teens with behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. 85%. And 70% of adolescent drug addicts in alcohol treatment centers, 70% of them come from fatherless homes. Don't tell me the father is not important. Right. If you're fortunate to have grown up with a father who taught you how to behave, taught you how to put a worm on a hook, taught you how to be a man, Amen. a little man, and you came up crying to him because you fell in a mud pole. He said, you'll be fine. Iron's good for you. Good minerals in that puddle. You grew up with a dad like I grew up. You know how important he was to you and to your life. But so many young boys and girls today don't have that wonderful privilege that you had to have a dad. Maybe you didn't have a dad. Well, I submit to you that it's time that you become a dad and start a new heritage in the family line of your family. My dad never had a Christian father. He grew up on a farm in South Dakota in the 30s. My dad was born in 1930. But I tell you what, my father turned what he did not have and gave me a wonderful heritage, a wonderful home. You see, I, I read this, uh, this one man, he, he wrote down gifts that my father gave that helped me become the person I am today. Think, oh, what did he get, a big car? And gave you a big inheritance? No, he, here's what he got. Number one, he believed in me. Number two, he spent time with me. Number three, he loved me. Number four, he praised me. Number five, he disciplined me. Number six, he taught me the value of a dollar. Number seven, he let me fail. Number eight, he prayed with me. Number nine, he loved my mother. And number ten, he let my coaches coach me and my teachers teach me. That's a good gift. Imagine having none of that. No male role in your, in, your, in your life as a boy. No mother in your life as a girl. Because this godly man ceasing goes both ways, whether it's a male or a female. It's a leader that's missing. See, we don't have to imagine it. We just have to look at our inner cities where young men are shooting each other. And, and astronomical numbers are amazing. I, I watch the statistics constantly. I have relatives up in the Chicago area. And, and, and the whole entire time that the uh, Afghanistan war and everything was going on, there's more people killed up in Chicago and, and people shot uh, up there. And don't talk about all that stuff. Right, you know? right. And all, most of it all happened in gun-free zones, you know. Yes, and the criminals see that sign, oh, we better leave. Can't have guns here. <laughs> Inner cities are largely uh, populated by minorities. And the statistics say in 2020, 80% of black children were being raised by a single parent, while more than half of Hispanic births were out of wedlock, and over 62% of white families were broken. How did we get here? How in the world did America get there? And by the way, America got there very quickly. It didn't used to be this way. I believe with all my heart that the number one reason in America that we've got all these crazy statistics now and this danger to our children. Man, when I was a kid, I got on a bike, went out my front door, got on a bike and just ran around, had a great time all day long, came home and got a sandwich with my mom, ran out, did some more. You kids can't do that anymore. It's not safe. Amen. I believe the number one reason our is because our pulpits went cold. Amen. Our pulpits went cold. You see, we, we, all across America, we've got these slick tongue wordsmiths. Right. They know how to carefully use terms to avoid getting in the fray, getting out against sin. And it's become so dangerous, carefully avoiding preaching against sin and sinful living. Take your Bibles and go with me to 2 Peter chapter number 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, i got to hurry right along here. I'm going to show you this real quick and, and, and get past it. But go to 2 Peter chapter number 2. Preacher, I think 2 Peter chapter 2 is a perfect description of, the, of, the, of the, what we got going on in our day. I mean, if you read through this, but um, if you look with me at, at, at verse, it goes through the beginning part of it. You can read that on your own. But if you go down and you get all the way down to verse number 19, I think this is a pretty, do you guys know, I don't know if you use this term around here much, but do you guys know the term new evangelical? 
Yes, you know that term? Okay, new evangelical is one who, you know, back in 1949, uh, Harold Ockengay was uh, speaking there at the Fuller Seminary graduation. And he said, we need a new form of evangelism. We're too different from the world. We need to become more like the world so they feel more comfortable coming to Christ. And he said, he said, I'm going, and he publicly announced that he was adopting a new term to define this new sort of evangelism. He called it neo new evangelicalism, new evangelism. And the idea behind it was to make the church more friendly for the lost people to come in. That's why you see all these churches now, and their music is rock and roll. Right. And, and they've just kind of thrown Jesus in the, in the, in the Word of God there. Let me, let me explain something to you very quickly about music. I always help you with music. It's a very simple thing. In the Bible, music has two directions. Two, that's it. One is to one another, brothers and sisters in Christ, and the other is to the Lord. Our music is never to try to draw the world in. If you, right. if you, if you try to use music to draw the world in, you've got to use their music because they haven't gotten saved yet. They, they have not had a new song Amen. placed in their heart. Amen. They don't Good. like our music. Good. They like their music. Right. They've got to get saved and have the Holy Spirit change their heart Good. in order to like our music. You know what's happening all across our country in all these churches? They're taking the world's music to try to evangelize the world. Yes. That's wicked. What Amen. part has Christ with Belial? Amen. You see, and as a result of this, look at verse number 19. It says, while they promised them liberty. You see that? We're not under law. We're under grace. Your preacher's a legalist. You know, oh man, oh, that's terrible. Blah, blah, blah. No, you see, the truth of the matter is, we've never been under law. We've always been under grace. You get saved by grace. The Bible, the law was your schoolmaster to teach you you needed Christ. But see, when you got saved, Jesus would say, okay, man, you're now on your own. Have a good time. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Yes, sir. But beyond that, our, our, our relationship with Christ isn't built on do's and don'ts. It's built on a relationship with Christ that's built upon principles. Those principles are what guide you. Because there's all sorts of things in the Bible that doesn't say, thou shalt not smoke a cigarette. Right? But the principle, the fact that this, is, this body is the temple, that helps you know whether or not you should be, you know. A guy said to me one day, will you go to hell for smoking a cigarette? And I said, no, you just smell like you came from there. <laughs> right. Right. He says, we, we, we promise them liberty. They themselves are the servants of corruption for whom a man has overcome the same as he brought in bondage. I'm not going to spend much time there. Go back, if you will, to Psalm chapter 12. But here's what, here's what they do out there. They say, oh, well, we're, we're not under law. We're under grace. We're free in Christ. What's wrong for you may not be right for me. What's right for me may not be wrong for you. You know, Charles Manson heard that crazy philosophy. And he said, if that's true, why am I in prison? If what's right for you may not be right for me, and what's wrong for you may not be wrong for me, why am I in prison? Right. See, that doesn't work, dear friend. Right. See, and we, we've got this constant desire to not be godly. Well, is it really wrong? My mother used to say, if you have to ask whether it's right or wrong, you probably should avoid it. Amen. Sometimes I'd say to my mom, what's wrong with it? And she'd say, well, son, what's right with it? I hated it when she said it to me. I was like, ah, oh. I couldn't figure out what, you know. But, but the failure of our churches and God's people in our society has slowly eroded away the dignity, the decency of our culture. It's gone. Many people feel that President Lyndon Johnson's great society programs contributed to it, and they probably did. The following I'm going to read you here is from a 2017 analysis by the Houston Baptist University. They said, by incentivizing government funding of single mothers who did not marry the fathers of their children, and by expanding the uh, panoply of welfare state programs to Americans who were experiencing serious stress and hardship, a series of significant problems became an unstoppable force, often referred to as a tangle of pathologies. Millions of Americans were soon engulfed in permanent chaos and dysfunction. Major metropolitan areas were comprised of block upon block of victimized children, broken families, and shattered lives. A plague of fatherlessness ensued, leading to nearly 72% of children being born without married parents by 2015. Marriage had become a rare and distant thing. And I would add, and if we add into that all the people that have lived together, had kids, and then split, the statistics would go much higher. Others blame popular culture, which glorifies single mothers while glamorizing absent fathers who get to do whatever they want without consequences. Ask yourself a question. This is not written by me, so understand that. This is a secular article. 
Ask yourself a question. When was the last time you saw a movie or a series about a male detective? Was the detective a family man? Probably not. Almost always such detec detectives are boozers, loners with multitude ex-wives and strained relationships with their children. Our sports and entertainment stars with multiple children by multiple women, none of them their wives, also give young people the impression that this is a glamorous way to live. Rarely mentioned are the often shattered lives of these fatherless babies who result from all these behaviors of these wild, out-of-controlled superstars. Another cause of the decline of the American family is the anti-nuclear family message from Hollywood. There are many examples, but here's just one. In a BuzzFeed article, the author describes how the days of Leave it to Beaver are gone, and most sitcoms and streaming shows now just stress how messed up family life is. And the writer concludes with this. I wonder what our society might look like if we saw all the familiar uh, humili humili uh, humiliation and trauma playing out across our television screens and perhaps in our homes and decided that enough is enough. There are more equitable, expansive, loving ways to live beyond than the confines of a nuclear family. No, BuzzFeed, there are not. There are not better ways to live than a nuclear family. They're not. The nuclear family has been the single most successful social construct in the history of the world. Even the left-wing Atlantic admits it, quote, a nuclear family headed by two loving married parents remains the most stable and safest environment for raising children. Amen. No, duh. <laughs> The Bible said that. But see, uh, if, if you go beyond uh, all these things that the world sees and you just see what the Bible says, you'll see that we've got to have some godly men to rise up. Amen. We just do. You see, if we don't have that, America has no hope. Oh, but Pastor, if we could just get uh, so-and-so elected into the White House, it's not going to matter, folks. Right. America, my father has said this all the way till his dying day. America gets the leaders she deserves. Amen. You want to see this nation turn around? Turn your life around. Turn your home around. Raise your children for Christ. Be, be a witness to your family and, and show them how a godly woman and a godly husband, how they, they stay together. And I don't care what the world, the world out there, you know, my wife and I will sometimes go, how long have you been married? You know, in, 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 in a couple of months, my wife and I will be mar married 35 years. And they say, wow, 35 years. And I always tell them, yeah, my dad just died last year. And my parents were married three months short of 67 years. I've hardly gotten started compared to that. <laughs> when my wife and I had our 30th anniversary, I think that year was my parents' 62nd or something like that. And I told my wife, I said, you know, to match mom and dad, we got to do this all over again, plus two years, just to match them. Do you know how much of a blessing it is to have that in front of me? Uh, my father and father-in-law, he, he died, uh, my mother-in-law, he, he died last uh, 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 November, and they were at 65 years. Amen. My mother and my wife's at home taking care of her mother, who's got Alzheimer. And, and, and my mother-in-law my mother was, the, in my lifetime, she's the greatest female soul winner I ever saw in my life. Uh, I, you never saw anybody like my mother-in-law. I mean, she just never passed anybody. She was giving tracks out, witnessing to people. I mean, she was all, you'd go to a restaurant with her, and you'd sit down, and she'd put you to shame. You'd be sitting there, and she'd say, Steve, that guy over there doesn't look very happy. Why don't you go witness to him? Why don't you go tell him about Jesus? You know? Here she is with Alzheimer's, and she's still, he doesn't look happy. I think he needs Jesus. She still, she still knows certain things in her head. My wife will wake her up every morning. We had a funny thing happen the other day, preacher. My wife woke her up. My wife, every morning, she likes to wake her up and, and get her happy, you know. And she's like, Mom, it's Friday. In two days, we're going to go to Sunday school. And, uh, you know, 945, 945, I'll be in Sunday school. 945, blah, blah, blah. She's just singing. And she's singing some other choruses. And Grandma says, what day is it today? And my wife says, <clears throat> It's Friday, Mom, and in two days we get to go to Sunday school. It's going to be a great day. And she starts singing, you know, uh, is in love with Jesus, something. When she's singing choruses with her, you know. And uh, Grandma says, what day is it today? And she's like, Mom, it's Friday. And in two days we get to go through, she's doing everything. She's going to try to cheer her mom up. And you know, over and over, like ten times, Grandma said, what day is it today? My wife comes out and she says, honey, I'm really worried about my mom. I think, I think she's taking another step down in her progression of her Alzheimer's. And I said, why is that? She said, she just keeps saying, what day is it today? 
about that time, we both looked at the front of my wife's pajama top, and it said, what day is it today? <laughs> so Grandma was saying, look, look at that shirt, what day is it today? And my, we were, okay, well, Grandma's all right, she can still read, amen? <laughs> Everything's good. <laughs> but my wife's taking care of her mother and being a tremendous testimony to her children and everybody that watches her. And, and, and what, a, what a blessing to, to take care of somebody like that. But, but that's godliness, serving others. Our nation needs some men that will once again try to learn how to think like God. Stop Amen. thinking like yourself, but learn how to, how to think like God. You know, uh, you say, well, how in the world can I do that? Well, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What you've got to do is stop doing the thinking and let him do the thinking. And you'll get him doing the thinking if you'll just get in the word of God and let him do the thinking for you. Like, for instance... Tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, we're going to have a church service. Amen. If you're able to come, you don't have to pray about it. Amen. You just be there. You let God do your thinking for you. Amen. Lord, I don't know if I should drink this beer or not. Oh, yes, you do. God, God, you already know that. Lord, I, uh, you know, and, 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 and there's, just, there's all sorts of stuff that, you know, you got to stop trying to rationalize yourself out of it and just think like God thinks. Amen. Amen. Good. We keep, we keep trying to come up with a way to extend our flesh a little bit more. But in reality, we just got to learn to think like God's okay. And, and sometimes we think, well, 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 if I really do that, it's going to make my life so boring. I'm telling you what, the day I got right with God every day since then has been so incredible, it's unbelievable. I mean, I've been all sorts of places. I've been on in, in, in so many hospitals and hospitals. You say, and that was fun. No, it wasn't fun. But I got to lead people to Christ in those places. Amen. I, never, I never started a soul winning program at any time in my ministry where, okay, let's go to the hospital and witness to nurses. But God put me in hospital beds. And for eight hour shifts, I'd have the same nurse. Kept coming in, checking my vitals, kept coming in, talking, finding out a little bit about them. I've gotten to lead a whole bunch of nurses to Christ. I've never led a doctor to Christ yet because those guys, man, they just come in and they're like, oh, you're fine, get out of here, you know, and they're gone, you know. And uh, I've never had a chance to really get a good witness into these doctors because I never get to spend time with them too much. But I've gotten a chance, I've, I've discovered, I, I don't have time tonight to tell you, but I've, I've had all sorts of experiences that God used my wheelchair to bring somebody to me so I could lead them to Christ. They would never have come near me if it had not been for that wheelchair. But God brought them because of that wheelchair. Sometimes my wife's been helping me and, and, uh, and, and pushing me and somebody sees and they'll come over and say, ma'am, can I help you push that? And she'll say yes. And then I get a witness to that guy and lead him to Christ. You know, God, God's in all sorts of things, but you've got to learn to think like God. God has given us his mind in his book. Amen. Number two, you've got you to be a godly man. You need to learn how to talk like God would talk. I'm, I'm sick of hearing these, hearing Guys think that they can stand behind the pulpit and swear. Amen. Man, if there's one place you shouldn't swear, it's behind the pulpit. Right. You want another, know another place? Amen. Everywhere else right. in the world. Amen. Amen. Clean your mouth up. Amen. Man, what, what, what's, what, 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 you think you're manly because you use wrong language? Right. You think it's manly to cuss? You know that? That's not manly. Right. My father was six foot four, 250. He had an ounce of fat in his body. He played Division I football, and I never heard a curse word out of him in my entire life. Amen. You know what his big swear words were? He'd say, for crying in the soup. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when he really got upset, he'd say, criminy. Or he'd say some other word, you know, some dumb word. I think, who ever heard of that word? You know, I said, Dad, where did that come from? I don't know. My grandpa used to say it. Mean, I don't know. But my, I never heard my dad take the Lord's name in vain. I never heard him sway. My dad used to say, you don't, how dare you damn anyone? Only God can damn anyone. He said, you, my dad, man, man, my dad was, let me explain something. Let me explain my father to you. We weren't allowed to say heck. You know Why? If you look it up in the dictionary, you know what the word heck means? It says a euphemism for hell. We weren't allowed to say that word. We weren't allowed to say gosh. We weren't. You said, oh, come on, what's the big deal? Look it up in the dictionary. It's a euphemism for God. Amen. It says it. Right. We weren't allowed to say Jesus. Right. I mean, come on, wake up, smell the roses. That's half of saying Jesus. Amen. 
I'm writing the dictionary, it says, euphemism for Jesus. We weren't allowed to say darn. My mother heard you say darn. She was about ready to, you know, you were talking about a switch. Brother, we didn't like switches where I grew up. I mean, we were, we, they told you to go get a switch. We were, nah, I don't know about that. Amen. So you guys can have that switch. I don't know, that makes me uncomfortable. But my mom, she didn't allow us. We, we, we just weren't allowed to talk like that. We we're supposed to clean our language up. Right. We're Christians. I just think, you know, well, who cares what I think? The, the, the Bible talks about the words of my mouth should be pleasing. Amen. We've gotten to the place where we think it's okay to have, you know, grow up, Christian. Grow up and clean, your, clean up. We are never going to reach this world if we think that the best way to reach them is to talk and act like them. Amen. We're right. supposed to be different. Yes, sir. You know, and I know people don't want to hear that anymore. But I found some reasons why people, sh you know, well, here's some great reasons to cuss in case you think you're just going to keep doing it. It pleases your mother so much. It's a fine mark of manliness. It proves you have self-control. It indicates how clearly your mind operates. It makes your conversation so pleasing to everyone. It leads no doubt in anyone's mind as much of a good upbringing you had. It impresses people that you have more than an ordinary education. It is an unmistakable sign of culture and refinement in your life. It makes you a very desirable personality amongst women and children. And number 10, it is your way of honoring God who said, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You say, well, I don't cuss God's name. When you got saved, you took his name. My children bear my name. We're the nickels. Wherever they go, they bear my name. And I pray that they honor it and not take it in vain. Amen. We think, oh, the only way to take God's name in vain is to cuss and say some terrible swear word using his name. But in reality, you own his name as a Christian. Amen. Don't take it in vain. Don't wear it in vain. Amen. Good stuff. Amen. Amen. Number three, he loves and helps people like God does. Now, nobody can really love like God can. You can't. I can't. But the closer you get to him, the more people will notice there's something different about you. Right. You're different. There's something sweeter about you. And I know men, we think, sweet. Reminds me of my, reminds me of my, little, my little Tyson, my little grand, one of my grandsons. In fact, his picture's on this tie, um, on this CD right here. I wrote a song. It's the last song on here. It's called God Made It All That Way. And a bunch of my grandkids, they, they sing on there and they say, they say, Papa, who made the big blue sky? And how come only birds can sing? And I said like that. And then I sing, well, son, God's the one who made it all that way. Okay, so my grandson, Tyson, he's, his line was, um, Papa, why does mama cry when you and Gamma say goodbye? Who's the one that made it be that way? So we get in the studio. <sighs> Tyson. Papa, who made the vibe this guy? Oh, man, it was, it was a disaster. It was an absolute disaster. We could not get him to sing on tune, brother. My father, my, we always said about my father, he was like a guy in jail that was behind a few bars and could never find the right key. Uh, that is exactly what was happening with Tyson. And uh, <laughs> the, 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 uh, my, my daughter's out there working with him, and, <laughs> and I'm back here with the engineer, and we're just hoping against hope that somehow he'll get something that we can get on this city. And finally, we, we were able to piece some things together, and we finally got it. But anyway, he's out there, and my daughter kneels down beside him, and she's like, now, Tyson, we've practiced this, and I need you to use, I need you to use, you know, your, your pretty voice. He's, he's, he's four. He's like, my pretty voice? I'm a man! <laughs> I ain't doing that! <laughs> and she's like, no, no, no. Okay, okay. The voice you use with your little sister when you're trying to help her go to sleep, you know. Oh, my goodness. But thank God he's a little man, amen? <laughs> he's a mud puddle boy, that boy. You know, don't you think it's about time that you uh, get serious about, your, you know, about winning souls, about living for God, about Amen. teaching others the things of God. I don't know if you don't, you guys don't have any bus routes, do you? You know, we have bus routes. Boy, you know, whatever it is that your pastor's got going on, get in it, man. Get in it. Get your family in it. Get your passion behind it. Because the truth of the matter is the goal, the goal of your life is to see your family turn out for God. Amen. Uh, thank God, you know, Billy, Billy, uh, Billy Sunday's wife, Ma Sunday, you know, their kids all turn to the devil. Ma Sunday turned to Billy Sunday one day and she said, Billy, we've, we've won the whole world and lost our own family. That's never my desire, preacher. I want to see so many people come to Christ, but man, what a disaster if my family goes to hell. Amen. I thank God that my four kids are all serving God. 
they're all saved. They're all serving God in an independent fundamental Baptist church. Amen. You know, using their life for God's glory. Be holy as he is holy. That's, that's what we're trying to get to. Holy in what you look at. I will set no wicked thing before my eye. Sir, you're walking around, you're walking around with a pornographic store. Yes, sir. Right there. Amen. You're walking around with so much evil. Yes, sir. It's all around us now. It abounds. Amen. But a godly man's going to rise up and stand for God, even in the midst of all that trash Amen. around us. Amen. See, we spend money on all this stuff, cable TV and computers and phones and all this stuff. I wonder how much we invest in the cause of Christ. Amen. Help, Lord. I love America. I love America. But she's just about done. This nation's just about gone. I came into the airport here in San Antonio. There was a group of about 200, 200 illegal aliens leaning up against the walls, all over, laying on the floors. I said to the gal, I was in a wheelchair. I always use a wheelchair in the airports because it's just too far walking these things and tears my spine up and everything. So pushed me past, said, who, who are all these people? She said, oh, uh, uh, and she's trying to be politically correct. She said, oh, they're all, uh, uh, uh. <clears throat> I said, they're all illegal aliens, aren't they? She said, well, that's one term. <laughs> I said, well, that's the correct term. She said, yeah, they're being flown to various cities. And, you know, they're all getting free plane tickets. That I guarantee you didn't get a flight, free plane ticket to fly me here. And, 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 and if a nation doesn't have a border, a nation does, isn't a nation. Right. And our laws are, you, you see, I don't have to tell you what's going on in America. I preach it everywhere I go. This COVID thing that happened, it wasn't about, the COVID, if you look up the word coronavirus, means the common flu or cold. They took that, used the media to make you so stinking fearful of a respiratory flu that people were going to the hospitals and the hospitals became the killing fields because instead of giving you medication to drain that fluid out of your body like everybody that has pneumonia has, they gave you medicine that was patented by Fauci and Gates that would keep that fluid in your body. Then you hooked, hooked you up to a ventilator and blew your lungs up. Killed people, they're murderers. Amen. They're murderers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go read and study about it. Do your own research. You'll find out that they want to bring the world's population down. That's what they're trying to do. Amen. Well, you know what? We're trying to open up the windows of heaven and fill heaven. Amen. There's an urgency of the hour, friend. An urgency. Amen. Help, Lord. Help. Because the godly man ceaseth. Determine in your heart whether you're a woman or a man. We use that term man tonight. Just lady, wife, husband, father. Rise up. Answer the prayer of the psalmist. Help, Lord. We need somebody to really get serious about this because people are playing games with Christ, playing games with Christianity. Time you get serious, sir. Sell out. Sell out, man. Everything. Give it all up to Christ. Father, yeah, 